everyone, this is Ryan Mariello. Welcome again to San Diego Cycling Public and in coordination with San Diego Design Week. So today, I have figured a way again to get Italy involved because as you know, I'm an Italophile in love with Italy. And if you're into cycling, of course, Italy plays in one way or another. Today, we're going to actually go to Italy via Zoom to talk to a gentleman named Darren Crisp. And Darren Crisp is an American. He grew up in Texas, went to school in Italy, and stayed there, had a brief cycling career. And then he has learned to make preeminent titanium bicycle frames. He's taking the best of Italian craftsmanship, and he is making special order, beautiful jewelry work, these titanium bike frames called Crisp Titanium. I thought we'd enjoy spending some time with Darren. It's great that he speaks English, that's helpful. And also to see what his incredible studio looks like. I started out uh, born in Houston, so I'm a Texan. Uh, went to Texas A&M uh, University, got a architecture degree there in 1992. And as part of my architectural program, I came to Italy to study. And my passion was always cycling, um, but I actually got into cycling actually pretty late. That, that started in college. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I used my, my hobby. Uh, it slowly became a business um, just because I started building bicycles um, as a hobby for friends and, and racing mates and buddies and stuff. People were asking me to make repairs and I was doing repairs for some larger companies because they had heard I was actually welding titanium. Um, and, uh, and so that just kind of steamrolled into what the business is today. And then I became an actual, a professional business in Italy, registered business in 2004. So, um, and tell everybody what that's called. Uh, Crisp Titanium. Crisp Titanium is actually the the uh, the brand, um, but the company is called the Crisp Cycle Group, and it seems like it's a big uh, conglomerate of a bunch of cyclists. But it's actually just me, um, and I, I had to use the name because no one would consider me when I was trying to buy parts and components and things to make bicycles because uh, you have to have a lot of buying power, you have to have a lot of uh, friends and know how, and I didn't have any of that starting off in Italy. So I tried to kind of make myself bigger than I was, gave the impression that I was a big company so people would answer the phone when I called up for, uh, you know, a, a Campagnolo group or, or, or such. So um, that's how I got started. And then, you know, here we are 16 years later, still still, still alive and kicking and doing well. So some, something's gone right. Just tell us a little bit about what you do now and then how that came to be. I think you've kind of talked about how you came to be. You've been working in metals in high precision fabrication for places like Prada who only accept the very best. But uh, kind of walk us through shortly how you got into actually making what everyone should know is probably some of the most uh, jewelry-like, beautifully crafted titanium high-performance bicycle frames uh, that are made specifically to measure. That's what you're doing right now. How did that come about? Yeah, well, I appreciate that. Um, this, this a secondary kind of rush of uh, adrenaline comes out that you don't really discover because you've taken it and you've, you've transposed it from your enjoyment to the enjoyment of someone else. So mm -hmm. basically the, the business has become this kind of concept of, well, how do I make, how do I make a bicycle for someone else, but transmit that kind of enthusiasm and energy in the fabrication and the whole process that the, that the customer can actually, um, comprehend and so there's a lot I mean I have some some customers where I go through you know 200 250 emails uh, over the whole process it's uh, usually over a year long process so it's not a quick one um, you know there's a lot of dialogue back and forth dimensions measurements uh, and, and I really feel like I know them like family and uh, you know these relationships have kind of been ongoing and it's part of the Part of the fun of it, um, but it also is a is an interesting time requirement because the more people and the more bikes you make, uh, the more uh, vast your your audience uh, gets, so to speak. And then uh, you realize, well, gosh, at any one moment in the day, there's someone riding a bicycle that we built together, and then there's someone who's having an experience that that we created together. And so that's kind of the part of the the passionate part about the what, what I've taken from my experience personally and trying to translate that into an experience for the customer. And so that's where, you know, I spend a lot of time with them. I also send photographs during the process of the bike being constructed at, at the end of the day. You know, these are the parts that we welded together today. These are the parts, um, you know, that we're doing tomorrow. You know, what kind of, 
graphics do you want? Do you want some custom finish? You know, anything that's personal that sticks out that you want to incorporate? You know, some people send me music that they want me to play while I'm welding their their frame, you know, because they're really into, uh, you know, a certain genre of music or they want a certain type of energy being intrinsically built into the into the bicycles. What you're talking about I, is is something I feel, which is um, there are objects that are just made out of material, but they can actually create a story or hold something more than just their material. I mean, you can kind of talk about that as a church in Italy. It's just stone and brick and plaster, but it actually holds a story that's pretty potent. Now, I'm not saying you're building a religious object, but I think you get my connection. And I think that's part of the power of design or intention behind design. When you put the intention into a product, like a church or a painting or a, a pair of glasses that you're wearing, people can feel that and you're communicating something. That to me is design. I think there's a generation of people fascinated by making and getting back to a life that they, they hear you talking about. What I want to illuminate now too is this is not for the meek or, or timid, not even timid. The, uh, this is a lot of work. And can you, my actually, my question here really is what's your work day like? What are the fun parts and what are the hard parts? Because yeah. I think part of helping this next generation find this path is also being real sobering about what it takes to deliver on it. Sure. Well, one, one thing that I, I struggle with on a daily basis, and this is a, a lot of it has to do with my, my ego, um, is that if, if I had this business anywhere else in the world, I could probably turn it into an industry because um, there are steps that can be taken to, to make the work go faster, more efficient, uh, lower costs. And those are all things that, that require um, actually concentrating on how I can add value to what I do. Um, because if I had this business, let's say in the United States, I could hire two people and we could be pumping out, you know, three, four frames a week and I could be driving a Mercedes. And so I kind of battle that because I made a decision to come here um, because there were things about that 25 years ago when I came here that I wanted to visit and I wanted to integrate into my life. And now, you know, with social media and things, you know, life just becomes so fast that you don't stop and take time to realize how good you have it. And so one thing that I do every morning when I come down to work and this kind of gets into my daily routine is I walk out over my shop and has a, I have a green roof so I can have a nice, a nice view of the valley here. And I kind of look out into the valley and realize how, how well my life is. There's, I don't need anything else. If someone was watching this and saying, wow, I'd love to do that. What would you like to tell them to make sure they were equipped for? For the first couple of years, my, um, my competitors were the carbon fiber, basically the carbon fiber industry, which is basically who makes 99% of the other bicycles. They're not, they're not metal or carbon fiber. So for a while I thought, well, gosh, I need to compete against these guys. And so I went up against that wall and then realized, well, maybe that's not what I need to be concentrating on. Maybe I need to become a little bit more uh, original in the way I approach bicycle building and see who is interested in my work and then uh, try and, and like I said, add value to what I can offer them. And so once I kind of realized that I'm not trying to uh, compete against China or Taiwan or uh, the, have the lightest bike on the planet or all of these other things, I started to uh, establish what I thought a bicycle should be and then promote that. But what I realized was that I had to have those experiences, those unfortunate experiences, those learning experiences myself. I had to screw up. So, and I still do. And that's, that's, that happens every day. So there's a lot of trial and error. Like right now I'm working on um, 3D printing with titanium. Um, and that's something that I've had uh, on, the, on the back burner probably for uh, seven years now. Um, and I'm still trying to get that out. I've gone through four engineers, uh, working on the fifth engineer. And... Um, and it's, it's a process that for a guy like me to keep fabrication and keep the production going, because I'm only, uh, you know, making so many bikes a year, I have to keep welding. And then once that uh, kicks in, I, um, I start, start with the project. And there's a lot of uh, time behind the computer, which is another aspect of frame building that I didn't, I didn't expect. I thought it was all going to be welding and, 
you know, sparks flying and, you know, having fun and, and it is fun, but there's a lot of dialogue. So at any one given point, I have between 80 and hundred different projects going on and to or, to organize the relationship with 80 people um, with 80 expectations takes um, a certain amount of discipline, but it also takes organization. Got a bike here in the rack. This one's going to, uh, it's going to Taiwan. And then I've got another one over here. This one's also going to China. Uh, I've got a lot of business in the East right now. Um, and so is my workbench. Got some old uh, mills that I got off of eBay. Um, got a little lathe. Got some titanium up here, some tubes, different size tubes, uh, mountain bike, uh, just some some machine parts there. And then to go outside here, this is the money shot. This is what everyone's been waiting for. Um, around the olive trees, you can see, this mm -hmm. is uh, Castillo Frentino. And so Beautiful. that's my, yeah. yeah. So I've got a castle, that's Montecchio Castle over there. Um, medieval castle, Castillo Frentino. And then we've got uh, just, Basically olive trees, a lot of a lot of olive trees, nice view. So, um, you know, I come out here in the morning, get a coffee, uh, lots of animals. I have uh, feeders here for the deer, um, all kinds no, I, of stuff. I get it. it Darren, your, your work is so beautiful. It's, uh, you know, the kind of detail you put into that is, is really evident. So, well, I appreciate that. Well, I mean, it's one of those things that, that when people see something that they can associate with their personal life, incorporate it into the frame, that's, that's the you know that's something that makes it part of their life. It's not me. It's I'm I'm just putting it on the frame. But it's a it's a project that we do together, and it gives meaning to for, for them. And that's what you know, like I said before, that's that part that I can add to the experience that that they that they find value in it. I'm Darren Crisp from Crisp Titanium uh, from Custom Fiorentino, and uh, I thank you San Diego uh, Cycling Public for your attention. I appreciate it.